title of the lesson is Parties, Patches, and Wine Skins. Yes, you can say wine in a Baptist church. Okay? As long as you keep it in the skins. It has to be kept contained within the skins. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And there's the outline. There's the outline for today. First, I would like for us to pray the prayer that I stole from Alistair Begg. Could we pray this prayer together as we begin? That's okay. It's going to fall off again, but that's all right, too. Yeah, I did. did she say, she said, stay, and it went. <laughs> Let's pray this together. Father, as we turn to the Bible, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your son's sake, amen. Let's talk about Luke. Who was Luke? Who do you think Luke was? Doctor, what else? What? You think? There are some that have suggested that. And also, but Mark's gospel is the one that is, is thought to be mostly from Peter. But yeah, there, is, there were connections. There were strong connections. He was right in there. Yes. Okay. Does that tell you some of the things? Because Paul's traveling. He also wrote Acts to Theophilus. The Theophilus. I love the name Theophilus. Okay. Um, he was a Gentile. Pretty sure he was the only Gentile author of the New Testament, in the, in the New Testament. Okay? Pretty sure. But it also explains, uh, I mean, we get some of that because he explains Jewish things to Gentile readers. We get more of that in Luke's gospel than we do. In, in other words, instead of just saying something that everybody would understand, he explains that in the Jewish way of thinking, this is yada, yada, yada. Okay? Anything else? Uh, yes, sir. I think I would quibble a little bit with that being just a Gentile. I, I think uh, more he is a Hellenistic Jew. Hellenistic Jew. And Good that point. Would, yeah, that, that makes sense. That would accommodate both the understanding that he knows the Jewish side so well. Right. But yet that he is communicating uh, the Jewish side to the um, to, to the Gentile or Hellenistic world. I want to make sure before I say this, when you say Hellenistic Jew, you mean somebody who is by lineage Greek but has converted to Judaism? No. no. That would be an argument, I think, for silence. I think probably more the case is the fact that he grew up as a Jew, very similar to the Apostle Paul in a um, in Hellenistic town, probably on the east of the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, his relationship with the Apostle Paul was that they were both kind of out of the same world. There you go. Good point. Good point. Interesting. I had not heard that. But see, that's why you're here. Right? <laughs> I, I love having historians in residence. Right? Keep you on your toes. Anything else? Okay. What's a parable? That's a pair of bulls. Yes, it is a pair of bulls. But not what we're talking about. Not at all what we're discussing today. And Lewis, Lewis is sitting back there going, dang, why didn't I say that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Shared stories. Stories. Parables are actually stories. We get the word parable. There's the Greek words, and that's you know that's where it comes from from a Greek perspective. But it's actually it's just a simple story that has a meaning that's thrown in alongside it. Okay, it just has a meaning that's kind of thrown in alongside it. It has multiple layers quite often. It will have, you know, something that is just the story level, right? And it would go a little bit deeper and maybe a little bit deeper. Okay, 
parables. We're going to be looking at parables that are in Luke's gospel. These parables also appear in other gospels. For example, what we're talking about today, this passage that we're looking at in Luke today, you can also find in, uh, and it's in Matthew and Mark. I want to say Matthew 9. I'm not sure where it is in Mark. But anyway, you can find them there if you want to check them out. You probably have cross-references in your Bible. You can check that out as we go through them. So we're going to look at a, a parable. The first one that we're going to look at, hello, Luke 5, verses 33 through 35. Hi. Hi. Hey, Shia. Hey. How's it going? Good. good to see you, Slick. Um, Luke 5, verses 33 through 35. Should I be somber or joyful? Okay. And it goes like this. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered and said, Can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. In those, in those days, they will hold fast. Now you're saying, that's not much of a story. And yet it is. And yet it is. If I were to tell you a story, during the Christmas holidays, I went ice fishing, and I just stopped right there. Don't you have in your mind a myriad of images that are associated with that simple thing? By the way, I didn't. But if you don't, you, <laughs> don't you don't you have images of me dressed? Don't you have images of me out on the ice? Don't you have me in a little thing with a little hole in it? All of those images go with the story, don't they? The story is there. It doesn't have to be you know spelled out in great detail. The story is still there. So tell me about weddings. What do you know about Jewish weddings? If you need cheat notes, you can look at one of those passages. What do you know about Jewish weddings? What? Yes, they could. I mean, especially if you read the judges thing. I mean, it got very raucous. People died. You know, <laughs> that wedding. <laughs> okay. What else? Oh, come on. Is that as deep as you go? Do what? A lot of food, a lot of drink, a lot of dancing. Serve the best wine first. Why? They were too drunk to know it later. What else? Is that it? Long, drawn out. Yeah, the, the wedding ceremony would, would last a week or more. <laughs> and you think you've been to some long weddings. <laughs> okay. Okay, some of you have already cheated. You've already looked at Matthew 25. But it says the unprepared vir virgins at the procession. Okay, I'm going to give you a synopsis, right? Wedding, a wedding, a Jewish wedding in 30 seconds. They get betrothed. The lady stays with her parents. Man lives with his parents, gets a house ready for him at the family place. He goes to get her. They have a processional that is lined with virgins saying, <laughs> They go in and they go to the wedding feast. They actually say part of the vows, all of that kind of stuff. They actually do part of the process. Then they go through the door. The doors are closed and everybody on the inside parties and everybody on the outside is left out. They party for about seven days and that's the wedding. Now, like that, that's a very simplified version. But do you get to the point? Do you get the point? Okay. That's why when we read about the unprepared virgins and virgins, and we're going unprepared, they keep their lamps burning. What? Why? What? It's because they were to lead the processional. They were to. They were to ones who usher him in, 
And if they're off buying oil and the doors slam shut, they miss out. They miss out. In Samson's wedding, they had a big old time. And Samson had a big old time and killed all the groomsmen that were hired for him. Well, he did. It happened. Read it. Okay? When we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, I put that up there for this reason. You see where it is in Revelation, right? This is when there's great rejoicing. Am I right? This is when there is incredible rejoicing in heaven. And it is related to, it is, it, it's referred to as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, should we rejoice or be somber? Okay, that's a leading question. Because what did Jesus actually say? Look at Luke 5. What happens when the bridegroom leaves? Then you can fast. I got a, I got a question for you. It, it's not as easy as it sounds, the question. Is the bride here or is he not? Uh. What? We're the bride. Did I say bridegroom? Oh, bridegroom. Is the bridegroom, okay, here or is he not? What do you say? I'm not. You'll say no. You'll say yes. Yes. You have a comment? Is the bridegroom here? Already, but not yet. <laughs> well, already, but not yet. I like that. Um, yes. Is it not? Okay. And I'll give you credit anyway. Um, yes, but what he said is, 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 is the truth, isn't it? Yes. Jesus has come. There should be rejoicing. I mean, Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And in case you didn't hear it the first time, I'll say it again. Rejoice. There's supposed to be rejoicing. However, we also have times of sorrow, don't we? Because we're still having to deal with this stupid fallen world that we live in. And it messes us up sometimes, and it messes up our lives. It frustrates the hound dog out of us. But in all things, we can be joyful because of Revelation 19. <laughs> you understand? In other words, there's joy of anticipation. There's joy because Jesus is in our heart. There's joy because he has overcome the world. There is joy because he is the true source of all joy. All of that is true right here and now, and yet we still face frustrations. So there's no easy answer. The book gives you an easy answer. They say it's, we should be joyful. But the fact is, if you aren't crying over someone who is lost, if you don't feel sorrow over someone who's lost, you need a new set of friends. You understand? I mean, watch the news. Wow. Well, okay. I can give an example there. The yes. Uh, in fact, many of you may, may know uh, Jack Faulkner, who was out of Sandy Creek for many years. Yeah, yeah. Now, he had a son that was killed when he was 16, I think it was, in a car accident. Uh -huh. And as typical family, they were inviting people when people were coming over and they had a couple that came into them that said, are you joyful? This is the time to be joyful with the Lord. 
Oh, yeah. Right, they right. Had, they had to say, well, no, this time when we are free. Yeah. But uh, can you imagine the contrast and how, how that did how that it? Had, um, had Jack been, say, a new Christian? Right. And for that type of attitude, he would have been, it would have been very difficult for them to have understood. Very difficult. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, let's look at. The rest of the uh, what Jesus has to say to us. Verse 36. He told them this parable. Ah, a story. Yay. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have a torn, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new one will not patch the old. End of story. Parables are stories, but some are shorter than others. <laughs> what's the story? No, what's happening? What's happening in the story? You could imagine me on the ice, ice fishing. What's going on here? John Baptist was the last guy from the old old regime, and now it's. Jesse, I should have known you would go to the eternal perspective first. That's not the story. It is the eternal story. But what's the story of what actually he's saying? What's the story that they would have in mind? He's talking about... We ain't to wineskins. Oh, you're saying when the water gets a hold of it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like they're taking something that was not broken and trying to fix it by breaking something else. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you why we have a hard time with this. First off, we don't mend clothes anymore. We don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. We just don't, that's not a, that's not a part of our normal routine. It used to be the normal routine, patching clothes and all of that. But did you notice Jesus says you've got a new garment, right? And you've got an old garment. You have one of each, right? See what it says. See what it says. Okay. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. Now, this is the New Living Translation. Do you get that? Makes it a little clearer, doesn't it? You're going, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. For then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, bless your heart. You can't afford jeans with no holes in them. I got you. Yeah, that's right. But I want you to I want you to see that. I want you to see that. Now I want to change it up just a little bit. Give you the Bob Young extrapolated version to 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 see if maybe this would make a little bit more sense to you and, and see just show you how stupid it actually is. No one removes a processor from a new computer and uses it to run an old computer. Yeah. For then the new computer would be ruined and the processor wouldn't even fit the old computer. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Now, does that make a little bit more sense? That's the story. You've got a new computer. You've got an old computer. Your old computer is not working. It's got keys that are still sticking from that jelly sandwich you had, you know, and, and it's, it doesn't work. Half the programs, you know, freeze up all the time. So you've got a brand new computer sitting here. So what do you do? What do you do? You take the processor out of that brand new computer and you get over there and try to make it fit in that. Why? You've got a brand new computer. What? 
<laughs> well, get over it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Why? I have never. <laughs> hey, let me tell you. There you go. There you go. You need it now. You don't want to take the time. Thank you. But no, actually, there's a lot of stuff. I, I use stuff. I, I restructure stuff and rebuild stuff and do it all the time. It falls apart later, but I still do it. Okay. Just because it's part of what we do. The bottom line is, you've got a new computer. Why are you trying to take, take it apart and make it fit your old computer? Let's look at wineskins. Because we're talking about the word of the day. It's new. We're talking about new wineskins, right? Need to first, let's make sure you've got the word... There's two words that are translated new in the New Testament. Okay. Well, actually, there's a couple of more, but one is new in quality. One is new in time. Um, when we talk about our salvation, it's both. When it's talking about new in time, it's talking about new wine. When it's talking about new in quality, it's talking about a new garment. Those words are used in those two situations that way. Does that make sense to you? Now, for us in our salvation, it's new in time for us. It's also new in quality. So it, it's not that, you know, you, you're tied to one or the other. I'm just saying Jesus is covering everything. Verse 37. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for he says the old is better. Bum, bum, bum. I, um, what does the word tradition mean to you? <laughs> Do we have traditions in our church? We have traditions in this class. We, we did one earlier. We sang happy birthday. That's a tradition. I know, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that in relation to this. But I actually had people that said, no, don't do that. I don't care what you teach, but don't get away. <laughs> don't, don't, don't chunk the butt. Come on. Come on. Well, the Jewish people are steeped in tradition. They are to this day. Okay, we are too. But I want to give you a Jewish perspective. Okay, there's a there's a musical. Love this musical. Wanted to play Tevia at one point, and uh, someday maybe I will. Um, the fiddler on the roof. He comes along and he says, "You know, we Jews, we like to keep things in balance. It's kind of like a fiddler dancing on the roof." You've got to keep things in balance. And he even says, how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition. I would rather him tell you anyway. How do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition. Tradition. We've kept our bond for many, many years. 
Sing along, tradition. 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 Okay. I didn't hear y'all singing nearly enough, but that's okay. We'll work on that for next time. But guys, listen, tradition, tradition is what holds a lot of Baptists together. See? We said, yeah, them Jews, man. Yeah, they, if they didn't have their traditions, they'd have nothing. Listen, there's a lot of Baptists. If they didn't have their traditions, they wouldn't be able to keep it together either. Let me tell you, guys. Let me tell you. It's a dangerous thing to let con traditions control you. And it's a dangerous thing to take the stuff of Jesus and try to fit it into our concepts of what Christianity should be. Instead of recognizing that we are totally new people in Christ, we try to fit Jesus stuff into our old lives. We do it all the time. And non-believers do it even more. They say, God's going to bless you today. Having no idea whatsoever what they're talking about. I know God's blessed me. I know I got this raise because God blessed me. No, you got that raise for whoever knows what reason. But don't say God blessed you when you are not honoring God in any way with the rest of your life. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. But people, people adopt this stuff and they put Jesus stuff into their old lives. We try to look at our old lives through biblical glasses and make our old lives work with a fresh perspective instead of, instead of, laying aside the old and embracing our newness in Christ. Colossians 3, 9 through 10, you laid aside your old self with its evil practices and you have put on the new self who has been renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Ephesians 4, 22, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Guys, the fact is we are new creations in Christ. But sometimes we choose to live our lives with our old thoughts, our old ways of handling situations, our old ways of dealing with things. We choose to do that instead of walking in newness of life. Jesus is saying it's new. Just like our relationship with me as the groom and you as the bride, it's new. It's something to, that we should rejoice in. It's something that we should find great satisfaction in. It's just like it's just like the new computer and the old computer. Okay? <laughs> we have a brand spanking new computer. When Jesus Christ becomes Lord and Savior in our lives, the Holy Spirit comes. And we, according to the scripture, have the mind of Christ. We have the computer of Christ. 
So why do we keep going back to that old Commodore and try to find something to fix whatever it is that's going on in our lives? That's just stupid. I'm sorry. That's the a, that's a Greek word for it anyway, stupid. Um, but it is. It's just stupid. But we do it all the time, don't we? Read Romans 7. Paul did it all the time too. Okay? We need to walk in newness of life. We were buried with him through our baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Guys, Jesus didn't come in the world to make bad people good. Jesus came into the world to make dead people live. You understand? But we're so hung up on the doing, we forget who we are in Christ. We forget who we have in Christ. We forget the strength that we have in Christ. We forget the power to overcome daily frustrations that we have in Christ. We forget. We need to walk in newness of life. Father, we thank you that in this miserable, tired, frustrating world, we thank you that we can walk with you in newness of life. Help us to do that as we go through this week. In everything, help us to see with your eyes, to love with your heart, to hear with your ears, and to know who we are. We are alive in you. And help us to live accordingly. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.